Let me hear some harmonies as well. Zita nifuata. Zita nifuata. E nitaka. E siku zote. So stand on your feet. Hakika. Hallelujah. Zita. You guys are so wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. While we are still standing, why don't we ask the Lord to bless our time together? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for already speaking to us through so many wonderful songs today. Thank you for communicating to us through the talents that are represented among the instrumentalists that played so skillfully today. Thank you for every young man and the young woman that came to this fellowship today. And thank you for how you have navigated us so far since the year began until now. Thank you for being with us at work. Thank you for being with us at home. Thank you for being with us in school. Thank you for protecting us on the roads. Thank you so much for education. Thank you for health. Thank you for strength. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for life itself. And thank you for the organizers of this ministry that have made it possible for us to meet here today. And so I pray that you would speak to us in a language we can understand. And change us by your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I have looked forward to coming here, and I thank God that Moz called last week and asked if I could come. We were talking about an event that is happening this Sunday and how Kubamba could participate in helping us publicize it. And uh, I told him one other thing I really wanted him to know is that I have a passion for young people. I have so much psych for young people. And I said, I hear, because I had heard from one of the sons that I mentor who used to attend K Crew um, and the, 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 um, the, disciple, the, um, the Bible study. He told me that you have a great Tuesday evening fellowship. And I told him I would love to attend one day. So Moz, all by himself, made it happen. I'm here. Thank you. The reason why I'm very passionate about young people is because they are strong. And when young people want to do anything or wish to do something, it will be done. And that's why John writes and says, I write to you young people because you're strong. And that is why I believe that a lot of uh, politicians and uh, you know, those who want to bring change in the society look for young people. However, what you don't know is that God is also looking for young people that will radically change this world and turn this world into the kingdom of God. He's looking for Joseph's He's looking for Daniels. He's looking for Timothys. And he's telling them, do not let anyone despise you just because you are young. Now, if God says that nobody should despise you, who am I? There's no way I can despise you. But also, if God says that no one should despise you just because you are young, 
then I am hoping against all hope that you yourself do not despise yourself. Hello. Have you met young people that despise themselves? They look at themselves, they say, I don't look too good. I don't, you know, I'm not tall enough. I'm not short enough. I'm not, I was about to say fat, then I realized it's, <laughs> it's politically incorrect. But I'm not what I wanted to be. I should reduce some kilos or increase some. So you feel dissatisfied. Or sh I should just be a little lighter or darker or whatever the case may be. And so I ask, how do we get these positions or these to, to this place where we begin to feel maybe we are not who we ought to be? And yet God says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. So if somebody told you something other than what you are, that was their opinion. Forget it. You take God's opinion and you're fine. So, no bleaching. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. And, and, no trying to cut weight if you are 60 or 70 kilos. It's just because you want to fit in a particular posture. No, don't do it. By the way, let me tell you, you may not like your complexion or your appearance and so on, but there is somebody somewhere in the world who cannot sleep because of you. <laughs> oh, yes. You want to change yourself as a lady, and uh, there is a man somewhere who says, I just like her the way she is. And there is a lady somewhere that just admires you guys the way you are. And so, don't try it. Don't try it. We will talk about that another day. Today, I am here to talk to you about the place of apologetics in your daily living. And of course, there is no way we can talk about the place of apologetics in your everyday life, in school, at home, at work, and so on, without understanding what apologetics is. So let's define what apologetics is first, and then spend time looking at what it does and how it is used, and then we will finish by looking at how you can actually do apologetics where you live. Now, I recently launched a book that I would like to recommend for those of you that like to read. Maybe uh, you could just lift it up if any one of you has a... Um, it's a book titled... Oh, there it is. Christian... Can anybody read? <laughs> you can read that. Okay, great. Christian Apologetics Through African Eyes. Now, a lot of books have been written on Christian apologetics from Europe, from America, and so on, Australia. But I had never seen an apologetics book written from an African perspective. If you have, please let me know. I'll buy it. As far as I know... This, to my knowledge, I may be wrong, is the first comprehensive apologetics book from an African perspective. Thank you. We launched it last week at All Saints Cathedral, and while it is going for 2,500 shillings, you can see the size anyway, 2,500 shillings in the bookstores, it will be available to Kubamba here this evening at 2,000 shillings if anyone wants to buy a copy. Now, I'm not here to sell books. 
I am here to tell you that beyond what I talk to you tonight, you can have something to refer to. And if you cannot afford to buy a book, please don't feel bad and don't feel poor. You can reach me online through my Facebook, which is Kigame Media, or you can um, uh, follow me on Twitter at Ruben underscore Kigame. And certainly you can like my YouTube channel if you're the musical si on, on the musical side. But thankfully, from about a week from now, we'll be putting up a lot of, you know, talk and uh, a lot of different programs. And so that is why if you look at it now, it's called Kigame Media TV. But that's fine. So you can actually follow us, you know, subscribe and get some of the material. Now... Let me begin by telling you that apologetics is a big for nothing word, which means taking the time to explain what you believe to somebody else and why you believe it. Explaining what you believe and why or the reasons for believing. It involves also answering questions that people ask about your faith. I am sure we all have encountered questions about what we believe. Once you become a Christian and you say, from today I am a follower of Jesus Christ, you will encounter people who don't believe the way you do. For sure, some of us have them in our families. Maybe some of our brothers and sisters are not born again. And they look at you like you made a big mistake. They look at you and feel sorry for you. They think you did not choose right. And some of them go beyond just sympathizing with you. They challenge what you believe. They ask you tough questions. In fact, some of you in college might have roommates that ask tough questions about your faith. Some of you at your workplace, you have colleagues that, you know, Every morning or afternoon when you have a break or through WhatsApp or something else that communicates, they will ask questions or challenge you regarding your faith in God, in Christ, why you believe in the Holy Spirit, why you think the Bible is the word of God. They will tell you, ah, but you know, Jesus is not the only way. There are other ways to God. They will tell you, you know, uh, Christians are naive. Christi they will even mock and say, if you are a Christian, ah, you'll never get married, you'll never succeed, you'll never pass exams, you'll never get a job, you'll never be good looking. And they give you all these funny thoughts about Christianity. They oppose it, they criticize it, and they ask tough questions. So apologetics is what you need to understand what you believe and then explain it to other people and also answer the questions that they bring against what you believe. Now, apologetics can be in any faith or any religion. So you can have Muslims doing Muslim apologetics or Islamic apologetics. The Hindus have their belief systems, and they do what we call Hindu apologetics. The atheists, those who claim that God does not exist, have their reasons why they say so. And because they, their faith or belief system is different from yours, they will challenge you sometimes to explain what you believe as a Christian and why you believe it. So, apologetics is what will equip you 
for an active defense and explanation and confirmation of what you believe and why, the reasons why. Now, if you think this is something that is just beginning today, it's always been there. When I was back at the university, there was a professor that did not like Christianity very much. And he would mock. He would say negative things in class as if he was paid to de-Christianize us. When you read chapter one of my book, uh, A Word of Testimony, I have a big account of what happened to me. And if you read chapter two, I also give some explanations of what happened in the university that I went to. So one of them uh, came to class one time and said he doesn't understand why Christians cannot understand simple arithmetic. And he says, how can you say one plus one plus one equals one? Referring to the Trinity. You know, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says, you are naive. You are thick. You cannot understand simple things. How can many be one and one be many? And there was a Christian student in the class who understood the implications of the professor's statements. And so he raised his hands, his hand, and said, but excuse me, sir. You may call us naive. Are you saying that it's impossible to have many in one and one in many? He said, yes, of course. It's not possible. He says, so how would you reconcile the fact that seven days equals one week? <laughs> you can be sure what followed next in the CAT, in the cut. You don't challenge a professor like that and go away unscathed. But that is just one example of what some of the students in our country and across the world are going through. They are challenged and told, you know, how can you believe that God created when everything evolved? You know, evolved. I've always wondered how things merely evolve. Evolution. And the problem is they never go far enough to distinguish between two kinds of evolution. One is microevolution, the small ones within the species. The other is macroevolution across the species, which means that a stone could turn into a tree or, you know, uh, a fish into uh, a man or some. So across the species, of course, you can have mutations taking place within the same species. And you can even crossbreed and so on, but you still have some original species. But macroevolution, like me uh, turning to become an angel, or me becoming uh, a hedgehog or a porcupine, it's not possible. Some religions think, by the way, it's possible. No, it's not. That if you do some good works, you'll die and then be reborn as something. You know, if you do good works, you are reborn as something better or someone better. If you do bad works, you are reborn as something worse, like a squirrel or something, a mosquito or something like that. They call it karma. If you have good karma, you go up. If you have bad karma, you go down. And so there are all these different things out there, and they come and challenge you. Or someone will come and say, okay, you say God is good. Uh -huh, yes. You say also that he is powerful. Uh -huh, yes. 
So you say he's both good and powerful. Yes, yes, yes. So they ask you, so if God is both good and powerful, why is there evil in the world? Why was Reuben, you know, why did Reuben become blind when he was three years old? Why did your cousin die if God is good? Why is there starvation in Turkana or Ukambani if God is good? Why the floods in Budalangi or Nyando? Why? Is God good? If he is good, he would be willing to do something about evil. And if he is also powerful, then he could do something about evil. Are you getting the dilemma? Goodness means someone should be willing to do something about something bad, isn't it? You rectify it. Power means that you have the capacity to do something. And are there university students here? Oh, okay. So there is one book in your libraries that is called Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. And it's written by someone called David Hume. H-U-M-E. Now, that is the challenge David Hume poses to Christians and those who believe in religion. And so, a lot of us get intimidated. A lot of us stop believing. A lot of us develop doubts. A lot of us want to quit. A lot of us begin to think, ah, Christianity is too shallow. And so we become ashamed to be called Christians. So somebody comes to your office and say, hi, hi, Mike. Hi, 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 Mary. Uh, you know, praise God, praise God. Mzuri, uh, mzuri sana, mzuri, mzuri, mzuri sana. You know, you want to get rid of them before they say, by the way, I was reading this morning in the Bible. Because you are ashamed. You don't want to be associated with a weak faith, with a God who actually does not deal with these things. By the way, just so that you don't go home thinking these questions are unanswered. Now we are dealing with the Mao crisis as a nation, isn't it? And we know that if you cut down trees, it will lead automatically to desertification. The deserts will spread. Now, if we lost the Mao forest altogether and Kenya became a desert, could any one of you have the audacity of lifting your fists or voice against God and say, how can you just watch Kenya become a desert? My question is who made Kenya a desert? Was it angels? Some demons came down? No, it's people. We blame God for aridity. We blame God for drought. We blame God for all these natural situations when man is the cause. When God put man in the garden, he said, be fruitful and multiply, but that was not the end. He said, have dominion over everything. Subdue the earth and replenish it. We don't replenish the earth and then we blame God for it. We don't clean our environment so people get sick and maybe die from disease, then we say, Lord, why did you allow that? We blame God for creating bacteria. And then we enjoy maziwa mala. <laughs> Somebody got it. <laughs> that is the problem. And so apologetics comes around to deal with these things. And by the way, just in case you think that this is something I'm cooking up, maybe you could 
pick up your Bible, and I'll show you a couple of things that uh, will show you that apologetics is a mandate that is given to Christians by God himself. It's his idea. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Is there anyone who can read that aloud for us? First Peter 3, verse 15 and 16. While somebody is reading that, someone else, please look out for the book of Jude. Jude is close to the end of the Bible. It's the second last. It has only one chapter, so you can very easily bypass it. And so you don't say Jude chapter, because it's only one chapter. So it's Jude verse 3 and 4, maybe. Yeah, we can read both verses. So someone read for us First Peter 3, 15 and 16, and somebody else, Jude verse 3 and 4. Actually, why don't you come up here so that uh, they get the recording? And the next person can be coming. You can use the mic. Please. We want everyone to be able to pick up this. First Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. So, but, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to e- Ba, 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 in your heart, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revive your good conduct in Christ revile, revile. revile yes. Those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Thank you. Please, a hand for him. Thank you. you. Okay, so let's read also Jude, verse 3 and 4. I wish I could have a lady. Oh, great, great. Come. Jude, verse 3 and 4. It says, Dear friends, Although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Verse 4. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are, ungod- they are ungodly people. Uh, sorry. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Thank you. Please a hand for her. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, to the first passage there, Peter is saying, in your hearts, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. The NIV says, in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord in your heart have the lordship of Jesus. And then it doesn't stop there. It says, always be prepared to give an answer. Always do what? Be prepared to give an answer. To some people, isn't it? Huh? No. To everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Even when they falsely accuse you and slander you, they would be ashamed of their slander, verse 16 tells us. Now, Peter says to be prepared when? Always. Yeah? Because you don't know when the questions will come. It's not when it's convenient, it's not when you're at home, it's not when you're less busy the attacks will come, and you have to be prepared always. Now, prepare, uh, to be prepared, it means that you need to do some work because preparation takes time, takes effort, it takes a bit of learning and study and so on. So it takes time. You cannot become a defender of the faith overnight. I have been at this for a little more than 24 years, 
And I can tell you, I have never learned everything. I wrote this book thinking, you know, I have something that I could offer the church. I could not include everything. The book was becoming too big. Then people would, pre- you know, begin to say, it's, I can't even afford it. Already people can't because of the price. But I pulled out four chapters. And what am I saying? Preparation takes time. It takes years. So don't think in one week you'll become an apologist. You keep learning. Be prepared to give an answer. Giving an answer. There's some of us who will be challenged and will not answer. In fact, sometimes we put up some excuses and say, stop asking foolish questions. We tell people, ah, you and your philosophical questions. Thinking philosophy is bad. No, philosophy means love of wisdom. Phileo, love. Sophia, wisdom. So if you're called Sophia here, you're wise, I hope. (laughs) Yeah, if you're called Phyllis, you can hear the Phileo there. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Yeah, philanthropy, love for people. So, philosophy, love for wisdom. And we're told Christ is the wisdom of God. So the point I'm making is, We need to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks. Let me give you a scenario. I don't know how many of you have been at home and then some people came knocking at your door. You know? Could we come in for a few minutes and uh, just tell you a little bit about, you know, the kingdom of God and, uh, you know? (laughs) Yes, they will come. Do you have time, you know, for... little discussion, and they're very courteous, most of them, and very smart. They come with a little book or two or several, and they want to have a Bible study like Kubamba has in your house or office or street or somewhere. They want to discuss. And what do many of us do? We tell them, go away, me, I'm saved. Hmm. One of them told a Christian who sent him away, if I had what you say you have, I would be the one knocking at your door. And I would not turn you away. But why is it that we can't sit down with them? Some of us, of course, it's because of fear, and mostly fear of the unknown. Some of us, it's because we don't understand our faith, and so we have nothing to tell them. And if you don't have something today, then maybe you're, you're actually right to send them away, to tell them. I hope the way you do it also leaves you looking like a Christian. So, And some of us are just rude. The question is, are you able to sit down with somebody who believes different from you and have a meaningful conversation? Peter says to do so with gentleness and respect. One of my mentors who used to teach me apologetics is called Dr. Ravi Zacharias. Now, Ravi has a good website online uh, that, that you can, uh, you know, check very often. It's www.rzim. The Americans would say R-Z-I-M. I don't know why. So R-Z-I-M dot O-R-G. And there's a newsletter you can actually subscribe to. It's called Just Thinking. And uh, um, there is another one. That's called A Slice of Infinity, and so on. You, you can look up the resources. There are some videos, some, some audios, and so on. Or you could get in touch with us at the Ruben Kigame Center for Christian Apologetics, and we'll be more than deli- delighted to help you. Now, what I'm saying is Ravi used to say, he's, he's from India, and so he would say in India they have a proverb that says, you do not cut off somebody's nose 
and then give them a rose to smell. You do not cut off somebody's nose and then give them a rose to smell. If you remove the sense of smell, how will the person smell? And that reminds me, how do we share the gospel, by the way? Do we go to people and all we tell them is how bad they are? You already know. Yeah, the gospel is not about how bad somebody is. No. You know, (laughs) we all know that we are bad. We are all fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. We know, most of us. If we don't, we will know. But the point is the gospel is the opposite of that. Where sins have been committed, they can be forgiven. Where somebody has completely lost in, uh, you know, hope in life, they can find hope. Where someone is afraid of death, like my people from Western Kenya, you can tell them Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he dies, will live again. So apologetics deals with those things. And Jude says, contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. To contend is to fight for. You know, when something is under threat or someone is um, trying, going to uh, grab a piece of the land of Kenya, the KDF will be there to contend with them. That is why they are in Somalia, to protect the sovereignty and integrity of our country. Jude is saying we be prepared to contend for the faith because it was entrusted to the saints, to the people of God. Christianity has been entrusted by God to you and to me. We are custodians of the faith. And so when you don't protect it, when you don't fight for it, You know, people just come and attack your faith. They say all manners of things, and you just sit there. No, that is so bad. So you read a column in the newspaper. You know, someone saying, ah, Jesus never existed. Or someone saying, you know, there is no God. Or someone saying, the Bible has many mistakes. And you just, did you see that article in the paper? You saw Last Friday, last Saturday, in the past, or in the, you know, some magazine. It was so bad. And you end there. Or you see a post online. Someone really smashing your faith to smithereens. And they're saying all kinds of things about the Christian community, about pastors, about the Bible, about the church. Do you know that the church is always on the receiving end, by the way? There's always a problem with the church, even though the church is the one that is doing a lot of good. Could you stop and just write back and say, you know, we may be bad, but do you also see the good that is being done? Today, someone could come here and say, you know, we have learned that Kubamba this and Kubamba that and Kubamba this. But have they also looked at what Kubamba has done positively? That is what I'm saying. So if you see criticism, do you just sit there or do you also say, oh no, I will contend for my faith. So it's a biblical mandate and I can share with you a lot of examples I would just like to read you a small bit because of time. I was told I needed to take some questions. So I'll read you a bit from the book of Acts. There are many people who have defended the faith. But I want to give you an example of Paul. Paul was, of course, learned and so on. A lawyer, a Pharisee, a rabbi, you know. And so, he was traveling all over the place. And he's the one who wrote to the Romans and said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. the power of God unto salvation. And in the book of Acts, chapter 17, we read some very interesting things. A good example 
of someone who defended the faith. I'm going to read from the NIV. The Bible says, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. Let me jump to verse 16 downwards. He's now in the city of Athens. If you know Athens at all, if you've been to school, you know that Athens was called the Eye of Greece. That is where the great philosophers were, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. They all came from the city of Athens, and they taught there. Now Paul is in Athens among the philosophers. Verse 16, this is for you if you are in the university. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this bubbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus. That's the, the discussion place. Where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are pre presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they mean. Verse 21 says, All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. But you can read on because Paul then responds. And I just want to tell you this. If you are going to stand out today, where you live today, the tool that you need is apologetics. The tool that you need is the ability to stand and defend what you believe and why you believe it. In my book, I begin referring anyone who wants to read the book to chapter 6 that is called Pillars of Our Faith. Because it's only when you know what we believe that you can then begin to explain it to other people. And as a Christian, you will need to spend time with your Bible. Because if you don't know the Bible, it will be very easy for some of those people to come and twist the Bible and even tell you that the Bible says when it doesn't. Have you ever had someone tell you, the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. It's all over. In high school, everywhere. In this, you know, even the, some politicians feel godly, uh, religious, and they come and tell you, you know, even the Bible says, no, it doesn't. Have you ever heard somebody say, even the book of, uh, uh, the book of Reuben says, no. You need to know your Bible. And the only way to know your Bible is to spend time with it. Some of you think that to know your Bible, you need to wait until Sunday when somebody reads it for you in the church or a fellowship like this. No, spend time. And I know that this particular ministry has helps that you can get that can help you read a bit of the Bible every day and maybe even finish it in one year. If you know the original, it's very, very hard for somebody to 
tempt you or deceive you with a fake. You know, bankers don't waste too much time studying fake notes. They spend time understanding the original. Once you know it, you will always tell the fake. Read. Study the Bible. I don't know why it is so hard nowadays for us to wake up in the morning before we do anything else and spend time reading the Bible and then praying and then facing the day. Some of us wake up out of our blankets, you know, jump out and it's like, Hey! Ninanja tasiwezi karanga. That's your devotional song. You know, and so, and I don't mean this in a demeaning way. I love the song. By the way, I, I used to play it a lot on radio. And, and I respect what the artists are doing. What I'm trying to say is, what is it you spend time with in the morning? You know? Mm-hmm. Or you wake up and the first record you listen to is, Nimesota! Nimesota! <laughs> you know? And so you go into the day, Kaumesota too, you know? Yeah. Now, what do you feed your mind with? Yeah, and there's time for that. There's time for fun. But what I'm saying is, some, the reason why some of us have very bad days, especially Mondays, <laughs> is because we jump out of bed and not only does the shower not know us, but the Bible doesn't know us either. And so you... Okay, sorry. <laughs> so you jump into the day. And those of you that drive, listen to me. If you step out into the day without your quiet time in the morning, you didn't pray, you didn't read the word, and off because you want to beat the traffic, woo, you know, you're on the streets. The first person who will cut in front of you, you will probably say a curse word. You will be screaming, if you're an employer, you will be screaming at your employees in the office. And some of you who are parents, you know, you want, to, you want to eat everybody because your mind is not stayed on Christ. It's not at peace. That is what is going to happen. So read the Bible. Spend time with it. Over your lunch break, get some time to not just pray, but read some verses. Learn to memorize the scriptures. Get to know the word. That's why I'm spending so much time on it. Secondly, get some helps. Besides the book, you can write to me. You can certainly um, uh, text me or WhatsApp me. Um, It's very simple. I'll be giving you my number in 30 seconds, so you can find a place. Um, People think I am not accessible. I am. I might be able to send you some material. So you can reach me on 720-661812. That's also my WhatsApp number. I prefer texts because I may not be able to pick as many calls as possible, but I will always get back to you one way or the other. You can also email me at Kigame, that's K-I-G-A-M-E, not Kagame, (laughs) Kigame at Fish Kenya, Samaki, Fish Kenya as one word, dot net. If you forget, just remember Fish Kenya into the net. (laughs) Okay, so Kigame at Fish Kenya dot net. And of course, like I said, you can get me online. I would like before... I ask uh, the leadership to come and lead us in prayer. I would like to just take maybe two or three questions, and and then I will sit down. Okay, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, First, guys, let's appreciate uh, Ruben Kigame. Thank you. You know, Wallace and I were discussing with like, yeah, this cannot just happen over one day, eh? 
because there's so much content and depth that we all need to glean from you. But uh, a question came in. Uh, I have three questions. Uh, you know, a couple mm-hmm. of guys have sent in a text message asking yeah. us uh, yeah. some questions. So mm-hmm. here's one. Mm-hmm. How do you explain the difference of similarity there of the Jesus in the Trinity and the Jesus who came and died? And the answer should be addressed to a Muslim who believes Jesus was a prophet and should not be worshipped as a god. Okay. Um, the question itself is framed badly, but uh, I'll try and attempt. <laughs> well, <it's not laughs> yeah, the way you frame a question will either solicit a good answer or not. But uh, the, the Jesus of the Trinity and the Jesus of similarity is not a good comparison. Mm-hmm. Now, um, but I will address Islam directly because I've done it in my book in chapter 2 on uh, the, the issue of Jesus Christ. The dilemma is usually between the Jesus of history, you know, the one who existed, and the one who does not exist, the Jesus, the Jesus of faith, they call it. But the Jesus of the Trinity becomes a, a problem to the Muslim because they assume that God gave birth to Jesus biologically. Yeah. So they assume that for God to have a son, then there must be a female. Mm. And in, in essence, they say God does not have equals. I wish I could... A- anyone who speaks Arabic here? Anyone? Yes? Okay, so... Kul Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad la kufuan ahad. So it says, no, no amen, please. <laughs> it says, say he's Allah, the one. Allah, the eternally besought, besought of all. He does not beget, nor is he begotten. So the Quran directly denies, you know, the Trinity by attributing womanhood in the equation. And so they think that uh, God committed adultery by involving himself with Mary and so on. So they already misunderstand the concept of begetting, Mm -hmm. and so you miss it. But uh, finally, so if you needed to spend time with a Muslim, one of the things you would need to do is not just spend some time reading the Quran, but also there are some good texts that we can send you, comparative texts that show where the Quran actually does contradict the Bible. And you could go on my website, www.kigamemedia.org, and you can listen to some of the debates that I've had there. But the point is, spend time in the Word because that is where the answer will come from. All right. Here's another question. How do you intertwine faith and life? Oh, that's a nice one. How do you in, uh, intertwine faith and life? And uh, continue to say, to say that what if there's a feeling that the two are constantly conflicting mm-hmm. each other? That's a good question. Um, there are people who believe that you cannot... Uh, believe and, you know, be reasonable or uh, believe and then live a normal life. So some some young people in particular are intimidated. They are told if you become a Christian, you sort of have to kiss your brains goodbye. (laughs) No. No, The the thing is, if if you read in Isaiah chapter 1 verse uh, 18, God speaking, it says, come now and let us reason together. God loves to reason about things. And um, in Isaiah 41, 21, it says, set forth your case, present your arguments, says Jacob's king. So God is interested in listening to even tough situations, tough questions about faith. So in daily living, if you have questions, God will not frown at it, and he expects you not to. So daily life does not mean that you stop believing. In fact, faith is not apart from life. That is the mistake a lot of Christians make and that they create a dichotomy between what you are Monday to Saturday and then on Sunday you sort of become holy. In fact, that's how all the radio stations in the country begin to copy Akina Kubamba because now they want to be holy on Sunday. And that's when all the TV stations have the Christian programs. So you dichotomize. The question is, where are you the rest of the week? And that is why for the Christian, really, secular and, uh, and faith does not count because your work is a calling from God. Going to school 
is a matter of loving God. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength, and then you must love your neighbor as yourself. It is total. So you don't leave anything out. How do you love God with your strength as a young person? These speakers have to be kept somewhere. When you lift them and store them up, you're loving the Lord with your strength. When you sweep the church or carry benches or whatever it is, or help you know, your mother to carry the 20-kilogram bag, you're loving God as a young man. With so when, you, when, when a place is congested and you say, I'm going to stand and I'll let this show show to sit down, you're loving the Lord with your strength. And of course... I hope in school you love the Lord with your mind. So don't be so smart in physics and mathematics and then somebody comes and tells you, give me your 1,000 and I'll multiply it to become 10,000. And you just go, hey, yes, Lord. No, no, no. No, please. Please. Always carry your mind with you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> here's, here's one last question uh, yeah. because I'm also looking at time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a question that has to do with the afterlife. And so someone is asking, how do you explain to someone who believes that when they die, they'll come back in another life. Yeah, okay. First of all, you, you help them to, to, to see that that is a belief that is not held by Christians. It is a belief that is held by Hindus and Buddhists and those of the Eastern religions. Mm -hmm. And secondly, you help them to see the absurdity of it. Because if good works can qualify you to be, to be born as something, you know, someone better, then you can trick God. But you see, the Bible says that it's not by works. If it was works, we would just boast. We have more good works than most, which is not the case. Mm -hmm. He doesn't measure us by our works. And, of course, it means that if you do less, then you, you also uh, decline. Jesus said, if you came to work at 9 or 12 or 3 or 5, you're paid the same. What is the same? Yeah. yeah. So the point is that... Um, if, if you're going to then look at the afterlife, and Jesus has said to everyone who believes, everyone, you know, that they will have eternal life, then there are no categories. But this is the, the trick. This, this is the really fun stuff of that question. Now, they say if you are born, uh, you, after you do good works, you will be reborn into maybe a priest, okay, or someone better. Uh, and then that's the highest you can be, a Brahmin, a priest. Then he says, after that, you'll be one with God. You are reborn. You become God. Okay? Are we together? Mm -hmm. But they also teach that we were all once gods. Okay? But we fell. First of all, I cannot perceive a God who falls. But two, listen very carefully. If we were once God, that is if. If we were once gods, and then we fell, and now we are down here. And then we climb the ladder and we become gods again. So what is the guarantee that we will not fall again? Hmm. There's no guarantee. Yeah. So that is a vacuous uh, you know, assumption. That's a vacuous teaching. It doesn't sustain itself. And when I come back another time, I'll give you some tools on how to disengage some of those arguments. Uh, you run every belief system or claim through what we call a truth test. And a truth test involves... For example, if something contradicts, throw it out. Two, if something does not cohere, if it does not hold together, like this particular claim, forget it. Thank you so much. It's been fun uh, having you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Ruben Kigame. And uh, before you go, before you go, let me actually give you the microphone one more time because I want us to close in a, in a different way today. Friends, have you enjoyed this uh, session today about apologetics and why we all need to take part in it? You know, because it's, there's something that people say that I do not agree with it, but I think there's some element of truth to it at the same time that, you know, that uh, many Christians in Africa, they say that Christianity is Af in Africa is a, mi is a mile wide, but an inch deep. Basically, kumanisha maze atuna depth kwa word. You know, and uh, I do not believe, I do not buy into that, but, you know, the challenge here today for us is 
if you are going to defend your faith, you, can, you cannot defend something that you do not know. Mm. And I do think it's important for all of us to make sure that we delve into God's Word. And actually, it's called Kekru Bible Study because we want to make sure that we get to know God's Word and we get to know God and God reveals Himself through His Word. And anything that goes outside the context of God's Word, mm. God is not in that space. Yeah. It's the truth. And many people will come, you know, with uh, interesting teachings that seem very good to do. But they are so far from the truth. But you cannot discern it unless you know what God's word is. And I believe that Paul in the book of Colossians chapter 2 teaches about that as well. So friends, uh, if we're going to honor what Ruben Kigame has shared with us over here today, it's important that we make sure we get to know God's word. We need to defend our faith at all times, not just at some times, at all times. And as we defend our faith, that we will do this with wisdom.